Dr. Mordechai Kedar is the director for the Center of the Study of Middle East and Islam under formation right now, and he teaches Arabic at uh, the University of Bar Ilan, the Basis Center as well, many other titles as well. And uh, you've actually taken it upon yourself to write a lot of articles to help the lay people understand really what's going on in the Middle East and we are living in amazing times in the Middle East, a real scene change, a real turnaround, uh, not what we've known before, regimes that we've grown accustomed to thinking about, dictators that we've recognized the faces of, they're gone. They're being just uh, taken out of the scene. And one of the, one of the big mysteries that you're helping people understand about is Syria. Uh, Syria is a mystery because media is not deeply in there. Um, it's more confusing than the Western mind is allowed to think about it through uh, Western media. I want you to help us understand a little bit about what's transpiring. Bashar Assad, the, uh, the uh, dictator of Syria, how long does he have? What's going on in the streets and who's fighting who? Well, start with the fact that uh, the Assad family, after all, his father also, he took power in November 1970, means 40, well, 41 years ago and Bashar succeeded him, uh, they never had any bit of legitimacy. They are Alawis, in Islam they are viewed as infidels, uh, so not only they don't have the right to rule because they are a minority, there is a big question if they at all have the right to live under Islamic uh, rules. They're not quite Muslim. No, not at all Muslims. They are infidel uh, sect, uh, which Ibn Taymiyyah, the big uh, uh, Isl Islamic scholar of the Middle Ages depicted them as Akfar min al Yahud wa Nasara, means more infidel than Jews and Christians, those Alawis. So, to begin with, they had absolutely no legitimacy to rule uh, Syria. They rule, the father and the son are ruling Syria by force. Uh, Syrians actually acted according to the dictates because they didn't have any other choice. Until recently, until ma eight months ago, when due to what happened in Tunisia and what happened formerly in Iraq and in 2003, and what happens in the media and Al Jazeera, which incited against the regime for years, and of course the Facebook and the Twitter and all those devices which enabled them to uh, launch those demonstrations without having the support of the mo local media. So all these, all these uh, 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 issues which combined together sent the people to the streets and the whole thing in Syria actually in a, is in escalation. In spite of the casualties, 4,000 people, n known people by names, were already killed. Who knows how many others will never return to their homes because they were detained by the government and nobody really knows what happened with them. And, and the people are standing up. They are not backing down at this time. Uh, we hear reports that the Syrian army, many defectors from the Syrian army, who have formed their own uh, banded kind of groups or renegade army, there's a free Syrian army, and, and they're not cowering, they're not backing off. Why is that? They, the Syrian people, especially those who oppose the regime, the Muslims, are in a mindset today that they are willing to buy the, their freedom even with the price of their life. As strange as it might sound, but this is what their mind uh, mindset is these days. They are willing to sacrifice themselves in order to be uh, uh, liberated from the dictator and from his, uh, his army and from his police and all the security organizations which control them for whom, whom knows how many years. So, when it be began to escalate, and the more people are killed, the more people are willing to go out of the streets with the, with the danger of being killed, more elite people, people from the uh, 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 political arenas already defected, people from the media, people from the, uh, uh, even from the army as you mentioned. Of course, in the army, it's not the units which defected, it's only soldiers, individual soldiers, who take their gun and run away if they succeed because the officers usually shoot them at the back and they say that the, the demonstrators killed, killed them but uh, with the time we, we can definitely see that more and more people leave Assad 
go to the other side or leave Syria altogether. They go to Lebanon, there are many refugees in Lebanon, there are many refugees in Turkey, there are many refugees in Jordan, and uh, Israel also might be a place of refuge for Syrians, especially from the southern part of, uh, of uh, uh, Syria, Dara'a, for example, who will ask Israel to give them asylum. Um, in one of the demonstrations, I think it was in April, like a month after the whole thing started in Syria, in Dara'a, and Dara'a really suffered from, from the power of, uh, of Bashar, I saw in one of the demonstrations, somebody goes with a sign, Yaret Israel Ihtalatna, means, I wish that Israel would occupy us. Because he already noticed that Israel is more merciful uh, about the people's life and health much with the Palestinians uh, compared to what the Syrian regime uh, or how he treats the, the, the people in Dara. Oftentimes I meet Arabs, they tell me, you, you Jews kill Arabs. I say, no, we Jews save Arabs. Arabs kill Arabs. That's, that's, that's what really happens. Look how many Arabs, and not only Arabs, infiltrate into Israel every month from Sinai Desert, some 4,000 every month. Little, do they, don't, don't they know that this is an apartheid state? Or all things, things which are said about us? Of course, they know the reality in this country. They know that with the minute they cross the border, if they succeed, if the Bedouins do not kill them to take out their organs, or uh, kill them because they don't pay what the Bedouins demand. So if they come to Israel, uh, they are being catered for, you know, by all these NGOs uh, who take care of them. They can have decent job. In the, in the hotel industry of uh, Eilat and all these things. Okay, I'm not saying that they came to, to uh, a heaven of uh, a five-star hotel where they live. Not at all. But still, compared to what they uh, uh, experience in Egypt and in their homelands in Eritrea, in Sudan or wherever they come from, definitely Israel is a, could be compared to little heaven. Uh, this is why they come here. Now, one of the most important things that's happening is the Syrian regime is a great friend of Iran and Iran is a great enemy of Israel. Uh, Iran has been using Syria as the staging ground uh, for two to three major anti-Israel motifs, uh, movements. One of course in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah. Another one is Hamas. They have their control kind of panel sitting in, uh, in uh, Syria and also Islamic Jihad. Uh, these are uh, blocks that are funded by Iran that are that are there really uh, as as remote controlled as 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 uh, remote controlled weapons against Israel and they're very successful because they're not states and uh, they, they strike at Israel regularly and really uh, this has been the forward the forward stage of battle between Iran and Israel now Syria is falling apart is this hurting Iran uh, is this hurting these Iranian proxies that are staging war against Israel? Definitely. And uh, Iran already, the Ayatollahs already announced that if Israel uh, uh, gets involved in Syria, Israel will suffer from Iran. And not only this, because of the Turkish threats on the Syrian regime to stop killing, otherwise Turkey will um, infiltrate into Syria and try to do something in there, they immediately heard threat from Iran that if you guys go into Syria, we go into Turkey. And uh, I think that they mean business because for them, uh, uh, Syria is, I would say, a Trojan horse in the heart of the Arab world. And Syria actually was loyal to Iran. Look, during the bloody, vicious war between 80, 1980 and 1988, between Iraq an Arab state, and Iran, a Persian state, Syria supported Iran, stabbed Iraq at the back. And uh, this loyalty between Iran and Syria actually went through years and all kinds of difficulties. So definitely Syria is very important for the Iranians, and the Iranians will not stay, stay, sit aside watching how the Syrian regime is falling apart. But they can't really do 
everything against it because there's also this little matter of the people of Syria who are actually standing up to the regime. And you yourself have said that it's a matter of weeks till the Syrian regime, the Assad regime, falls. So uh, Iranian pressure notwithstanding, it's going down seemingly. Yes, but don't forget that Iran have all kinds of other levels on the world, like the Gulf oil. Look, it's enough if they say that they put a mine into the Hormuz Straits, immediately uh, oil prices will be double. And we are, we are entering a winter, <coughs> a winter in the northern hemisphere, and the winter they do need the oil. So uh, definitely Iran can, uh, without uh, shooting, yet Iran has enough, uh, uh, um, enough tools how to, maintain, how to maintain pressure on the world not to get involved in Syria. But that's what I'm saying. The people themselves uh, of Syria are not sitting idly by, and, and they, are, they are, in a sense, you, say, you started this interview by saying the people are willing to lay down their lives. And I'm wondering if the people of Iran are watching this and thinking to themselves, what happened in 2009 when we didn't succeed to, to, to overturn the government, maybe we'll have a second chance at it. Maybe we should also get up and go. Maybe we should even lay down our lives for the price of freedom. People in Iran see not only what happens in Syria, they saw what happened in Tunisia, what happened, what happened in, in Libya, what happened in, in Egypt. In Egypt is uh, just like what happened in, in, in Tehran. And what, happens, what happened in, in, uh, in Yemen, that the president had to step aside. So, by agreement, by, yet he had to give up on the, on the regime. So uh, definitely they see the, what goes on around them. And uh, they do hope that someday will come and they will be able to do the same thing. However, don't forget that, unfortunately, the West supports the Iranian regime. How do so I say that again? Yes, the West supports the Iranian regime. How do I know? Only today, France announced that it would stop buying oil from the Iranians. Guys, are you still buying oil from the Iranians? What do they do with the money? Okay, one thing. Second thing, uh, the Iranians are using all kinds of equipment and software which was given to them, sold to them, by Siemens from Germany and by Nokia, the Norwegian. I'm not buying those phones again. And, and, why? With this equipment and software, they locate all those uh, descendants uh, dissident, dissidents in, in Iran uh, who use uh, all kinds of uh, websites in order to call for pe to people to, co to go to the streets and cell phones. And this is how they succeeded to crash the, the demonstrations in 2009. And this equipment today was brought to Syria for the same purpose. And it is operated by Iranians in Syria. So definitely the West, for money, actually supports the most oppressive, vicious regimes in the Arab world. And this is what I'm always asking. How come, guys, you enjoy democracy, human rights, political freedoms? How come you help those regimes only for money? Dr. Mordechai Kedar of the Basel Center of Barilan and also the uh, director for the Center of the Study of the Middle East and Islam Information right now. Congratulations on that and thank you so much for being with me here today. Thank you very much.